So I know that the left has been feeling a little bit down recently, and understandably so, man. You know, I went through it just like you guys went through it. The high that we had on the night of the Nevada caucus, where not not only did Bernie win, he crushed. And that made it effectively three wins in a row, three popular vote wins in a row to start the primary, and nobody had ever done that and then lost. So we're going thinking, okay... The conversation we were having at the time was, is he going to win an outright majority or is he going to win a plurality? And if there, it's a plurality, we know they're going to do a contested convention to try to take it from him. And so we were all saying, we got to get ready to go to Wisconsin and to, to you know stop them from trying to steal it from him. But that was the discussion, plurality or, or majority. That was it. That Those were the options. And then it all fell apart so quickly. There are a variety of things that went into it. There was poor strategizing from Bernie and his team, uh, the inability to change and acknowledge the new reality. They were trying to run, getting a, a you know, they were trying to win with a mi minority, like win with 35%. But when the field was no longer fractured and the centrist consolidated, they needed to adjust and they just didn't adjust. And then also you could blame all the smoke-filled backroom deals, which inevitably killed Bernie, Obama making the phone call to Mayor Pete and Amy Klobuchar, offering them positions to drop out, endorse Joe, and Elizabeth Warren staying in, which helps screw Bernie. Everything. It was the perfect storm, and it just all fell apart. So we went from on top of the world to basically feeling like totally hopeless, and now we're back in the same position we were in 2016, where everybody was arguing about what to do in the general election. Do you suck it up and do, you know, the lesser evil vote, or do you not do it? Like, these are the, now the discussions that we're having. Well, guess what, guys? For 2024, there is hope. There is hope on the horizon. So, the great Nina Turner went on The Young Turks. She's talking here to Cenk Uger and to Benjamin Dixon. And look at the question they ask and her answer. Are you thinking about 2024? I am. I mean, there are lots of people that I hear from all the time, from all over this country, you want me to consider running again. It's always something that is on my list. But for this moment, I'm going to continue to help progressive candidates, progressive causes. I'm also going to nav not continue to navigate the racial justice space uh, to do those things. So we need corporations to come on through. Now, they come through for themselves and the tax breaks and how they lobby Congress. We need them come on through for the people. And there is a way to get those corp some of those corporations to do that, especially on the justice side, since the killing of George Floyd, we know that a number of corporations have pledged a whole lot of money for racial justice. Let's see if they can do that. So I'm also going to put some of my talent on, on that side. But absolutely strong consideration for 2024, no doubt. If Nina Turner runs, that's my candidate. She'll have my full support. And I'll do everything I can to help get her elected. And I hope she does run. I really do. So when, when you look at the options that are available to us, so we covered the poll. There was a poll that came out recently of the 2024 prospects and, you know, the list was not looking great. It was like Andrew Cuomo was on top and then you also had like Mayor Pete who was like close to the top and um, it just didn't look great for the left in terms of our future prospects in the 2024 presidential race. Now, by the way, let me just say, Funny enough, when you get to the Senate level and you get to, the, to Congress people, and even when you get to like state and local elections, the left has been doing really good. Like there's been a bunch of instances of like DSA endorsed candidates or, uh, you know, all these other left wing groups like these candidates winning. So I'm not trying to say it's all it's all bad. It's just when you look at at the presidential level, the numbers didn't look great for us because there were a lot of like establishment types who were kind of at the top of the list. So, you know, I I was thinking about it, and I'm like, well, who who would we want? Like, who would we want to run and win? Now, a lot of people are going to say Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez would be the first one that comes to their mind. You know, I don't know her age, but she might... She's either not going to be old enough by 2024, or she'll just barely be old enough. Um, And I don't... And then I think there are also other issues where... In the time that she's been there, 
she has pissed quite a few people off in terms of constituencies that we would need as as a voting base in order to win. So I'm not sure, no disrespect to her, but I'm not sure that's the direction for 2024. Um, she might want to go like Senate seat before she even goes like for president. Um, but I, and I also think she leaned maybe a little too hard into social issues and not enough into economic issues. And I didn't like it when she kind of, when it came to Ilhan Omar and Ilhan Omar was getting smeared as an anti-Semite and she kind of came out and did this almost like this both sides commentary of like, we need to hear people out instead of just flat out defending Ilhan that got under my skin a little bit. So there, there are issues there. So, but a lot of people would bring her up and I would say, I'll be kind and just say, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, but then who else would be on the list? Honestly, the next one that came into my mind, Andrew Yang. I think he, be, and, and I get it. A lot of people out there, oh, come on, because, you know, he famously backed off of Medicare for all, which pissed me off and pissed many people off. He also endorsed Joe Biden pretty early, which got under my skin and got under many other people's skin. Um, but I really thought he's one of the top hopes because I think he's movable on issues like Medicare for all. I think if, if you make an actual logical argument to him and show him exactly why it is objectively empirically a better path that you could change his mind. And you want to know why I say that? Cause I think he's an, an, a really honest guy. I think he's an honest guy and he can be moved on things. If you show him enough evidence I don't think he's just motivated by, like, careerism like a lot of the other people in Washington, D.C. So Andrew Yang is somebody who's on my list of, like, maybe, maybe, but we don't know. We don't know, you know, if slash when that day will come, if he wants to run again, or if he might be doing something else. I don't know. I don't know. Then the other one that popped in my mind was Jesse Ventura. Now... He was considering maybe running Green Party, but it didn't work out because of backroom stuff that was happening behind the scenes. So I, I don't want to get into that, and I don't know too much about that, to be honest with you guys. But what I do know is, if he runs, he would make a splash. And, you know, if he runs as on one of the two major parties, he has a chance of winning. So, and I think Democrat is closer to him than Republican is. He's got politics that are very similar to mine. And so I was thinking, hey, he's somebody who could seriously, almost, he, almost like a Trump of the left. Like, he could come in and kind of shake everything up, and he's such an interesting character, such an interesting guy, and he's, like, uniquely honest and has integrity. Now, the downside of him would be, I don't think he would run as a Democrat, which means if he runs as, I don't think he has any chance of winning if he runs as an independent or runs as, you know, a third party. No disrespect to the third parties. I'm just saying, realistically, you're not going to win in 2024. It's, if you want to build one of these parties, it's a very long-term goal. It won't happen immediately. Um, but also, that show conspiracy theory that he did was a little too kooky, even for me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to, you know, look past a lot of that stuff, but um, that show was out there. There was some conspiracy theories that I thought, like, this is ridiculous. So, again, I love Jesse Ventura. I really do. Um, but he was one that popped to, into mind. But of everybody I named so far, I like him, but there are issues. There are issues. Then Nina Turner came to mind. There's no issues. <laughs> That's I, I feel like she's uh, closest uh, to my politics, and she has all of the political talent in the world that I've ever seen. She, the way she speaks, she could burn a place down with enthusiasm and the energy that she gives off and I think she's, I think she'd be perfect for it. I do. Now, what will she be attacked with? I think she'll be attacked with lack of credentials that she hasn't had. You know, she's never been a Congress, per, a U.S. Congress person. She's never been a senator. So I feel like people might use that to attack her. I think you kind of could kind of brush off those attacks. I don't really think they're that serious. We have a freaking reality star buffoon who's president now. He has way, he had way fewer credentials in politics than Nina Turner does. Um, but she ran our revolution. I believe she was a, a state senator uh, for Ohio. Um, and I think she's amazing. I really think she is. Um, I think she has the most potential of everybody that I just listed. And I would absolutely positively 100% without a doubt support her. There would be some hurdles in terms of how it would go in a primary. Um, 
I think one of the reasons why Barack Obama ended up winning in 2008 is that, yes, he ended up becoming the first black president, but if you look at his rhetoric on racial issues, man, he sounded pretty conservative. At, at most, he was centrist on race issues. He gave a famous speech where he basically tried to do the whole, like, wag your finger at black fathers. Um, and so it, it, was, it was a concerted effort and a strategy on Obama's part and on his team's part to be like, you almost have to, like, take a step back and almost not touch racial issues because, and I do believe that this was the calculation, this country in many ways is still racist. And, you know, they they almost strat strategized and used that against everybody. You know what I mean? Like, they took the fact that it's still in many ways a bigoted country, and he was able to jujitsu the country and strategize where he's like, well, what if I'm the first black president, but I just don't really talk about race? And whenever I do talk about race, I sound like moderately conservative. Then do you like me? And yes, keep it real. What happened is there are a lot of white moderates, the one that MLK talked about and said they're the biggest impediment to change. There are a lot of white moderates who looked at Obama and said, that's my, that's my guy right there. That's my candidate. America found a good one. That's, that was the, the mindset. So... In many ways, that annoyed the left, but you got to keep it real. It was also strategically brilliant on the part of the Obama campaign to understand, to almost tap into the racial mood of the country and realize, like, okay, this country will accept black leaders for sure. Will it accept black leaders who lean into racial issues? Mm, that's a lot harder for the white moderate to get on board with. So basically, it was a concerted effort from the Obama team. We're going to take a couple steps back on like racial issues. We're going to stay out, but to the extent we ever talk about it, they did sound moderately conservative. Um, and he did he like he would stress personal responsibility stuff. That's all right wing talking points, guys. That's what it is. But it struck the right chord where the. The entire country and so many white people were like, we love this guy. And so I do think Nina Turner would have run into similar issues because it is harder for any black politician. It is harder. There's so much more of a balancing act. It's almost like you get more freedom to talk about like racial justice stuff if you're a white person, because then other white people are more likely to listen and be like, hmm, interesting. Like, tell me more. But if you're a black leader and you lean into racial stuff, They'll immediately accuse, oh, you're always playing the race card. Uh, why you got to be divisive? Like, these are the things that they'll trot out against any black leader. So Obama masterfully and strategically worked around that and won the White House. For Nina Turner, I do think she would run into a similar conundrum, which is like, okay, kind of a little bit of a bigoted, racist country. How do you strategize in a way where Nina Turner can bring together the entire working class, but that includes people of color and the white working class. And honestly, the way that you get white working class people to get on board is if Nina Turner were to lean into economic stuff, healthcare stuff, things that affect everybody. That's not to say that you abandon your principles and the policies of racial justice, because we never give an inch on policy. This is a hallmark of being a real leftist. Yes, you have litmus tests. But the litmus test is on policy. It's not on personal story stuff. So Nina Turner should never back off of her correct positions on policy. But should there be an attempt to use strategic rhetoric in order to basically unite everybody and lean into other issues of healthcare and economics and war, things where you build that multiracial coalition? But you do it by leaning into the issues that impact everybody, while not necessarily leaning into the racial issues, but still pushing for the right policies when you're in power. See, you have to get to power to actually win on any of these things. And the way you get to power is by being strategic. And the way you be strategic is to lean into the issues where you have an advantage. And the left has an advantage on what issues? Medicare for all, corruption issues, the economy, war, ending war. So, the
the left loves to, I don't know what it is about the left, but the left loves to lean into the things where we're not popular <laughs> and not lean into the things where we are popular, which then what happens makes people hate you. That's what happens. It's like a tweet I saw the other day where they were like, somebody said, oh, I love white leftists telling other white leftists that it was okay that they were once fascists. No, honey, it's not. And it's like, okay, well, good luck building a winning coalition, actively telling people you're not allowed in even if you reform and come to my ideas. <laughs> the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And this, this is kind of in the same vein as that. Like, in order for the left to win, the left needs to be strategic. The way you're strategic and the way you win at politics is to lean into the issues where people agree with you and like you, and don't lean into the issues where people are not necessarily on board. So, anyway, I think uh, one of the hurdles that Nina Turner would face is how do you deal with the fact that we still in many ways have a bigoted country, we still in many ways have a racist country, we still in many ways have a country that I do think would turn away from and shy away from a strong black woman making arguments on identity that are very pro-black. And so I think that's a, a stumbling block. That's a hurdle, but it's not one that I don't think she can clear. I think she has the political skill to clear it. I do. Um, and if you listen to Nina Turner talk, man, she's amazing. And I do think she has the ability to bring in the entire multiracial working class, but even those like older white workers, if they really listen to Nina Turner... I think they find themselves agreeing most of the time. And so we need to translate that into votes for a left agenda. And I do think she's the heir apparent to the Bernie throne, in my opinion. He built this brilliant thing in 2016 and, and 2020, got all these people politically involved. I do think she's, she's best positioned to kind of inherit the movement and be the new leader. And um, I think she has all the tools that are necessary, and then it would just be a matter of, okay, how do we strategize in a way where we can get as many people with us as possible so we win power, and then we get our entire policy agenda implemented? Not just on healthcare stuff and economic stuff, but also on racial stuff and everything, every aspect of the agenda. So I love it. I'm looking forward to it. Nina has my full support if she indeed jumps in, and I hope she does jump in.